All right, what's going on, guys? Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, I'm chatting with a homie of mine and training partner, Darrell Petties, or as uh, we call him, Darrell Petties. So, <laughs> D, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for jumping on the show. Uh, super excited to chat with you, actually. Um, why don't you just start off by introducing yourself to some listeners? Uh, thanks. Um, like Dan said, my name is Darrell Petties. I live and train here out of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I've been powerlifting for going a little over two and a half years now. Uh, before that, I was a high-level basketball player. I played down NCAA down the States for a bit. Uh, played sports my whole life. And then after that was over, got into personal training. And then eventually just transitioned over to strength sports and powerlifting. Yeah, and that was actually how I met you. We uh, we actually worked – well, no, actually, we went to the same high school. Yeah, we were, Shit, we we were in high school, but it was – yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, we weren't really friends. We weren't enemies or anything. We weren't really. We didn't really hang out in high yeah. school. And then we uh, we ended up linking up because we worked at the same gym, um, way way later. So yeah, today we're going to be talking about deadlifting. And Darrell knows a thing or two about a thing or two when it comes to deadlifting. Um, so Darrell, for those of you guys who don't know him, uh, has over an eight hundred pound deadlift in competition. Uh, which is pretty pretty big. Uh, puts you at what, what? What did that say? Like the? I think it was like 02 percent. Yeah, something like that. Of of all of the lifters and all weight classes, so that ends up being pretty impressive. Not not a lot of people can get uh, to an eight hundred pound deadlift. So um, I've definitely learned a lot from you when it comes to not just deadlifting, but kind of coaching and, and training in general. So uh, why don't we just start off with? You know, what are some of the most common mistakes you see people making when they are deadlifting, regardless of whether or not it's sumo or deadlift, or if you want to kind of segment those in, into two different uh, kind of answers? Oh, okay. First of all, I'll just address both, really. I think one of the most common flaws I see is people dragging the bar up their shins. I know a lot of people are told, get the bar to the legs and pull straight up, but I feel you're working against yourself for the lift. And it's just counterproductive. If you want to move the bar in a fast, straight line, why are you rubbing it up your shins and legs? Because if you're going to run a sprint, you don't put your shoulder on a wall and try and run that sprint because you're going to lose speed and not be at your fastest. So I just, that's one thing. Another thing is dropping your deadlifts. Now I understand if at the end of your set, you just drop it down, kind of like a mic drop. But I mean, each rep, not controlling it on the way down. I feel like you're missing out on the eccentric portion of your deadlift, which is going to build some serious strength out of you. And I feel that's how people stall out because they'll get their numbers high because they're training deadlift all the time. But then when it comes to breaking a plateau, they don't know how to get through it. And it can be as simple as just control your damn deadlift. Yeah. And that's honestly something that's, that's pretty crazy because there's a couple different camps there, right? Like, um, well, I guess it's more for touch and go versus a full reset, but yeah. a lot of people do that. And I mean, if you think about it, you're really cutting your work in half. Like you're cutting out the entire eccentric component of, of the lift if you're not controlling it on the way down. Um, now, you obviously don't have to do like a four second eccentric or anything crazy like that. But I definitely noticed that, that when I started doing a little bit more of that, man, a set of 10 or a set of five or regardless of how many reps you're doing, it ends up being substantially harder than, than just kind of dropping it on every single rep. Um, so have you always deadlifted like that or, or did you start uh, another way? Honestly, I, I got my start with deadlifting before powerlifting. It was just uh, something I was trying out in the gym and did it because my friends did it. And the I was working out at just a, a normal rec gym, family gym. So you got complaints if people are deadlifting too loud. So it kind of happened out of necessity at first. And then the higher everything got, I just realized if I wasn't, if you're not bouncing the weights off the ground for a touch and go, or even if you're doing a full reset, controlling the weight on the way down, I noticed for myself a big increase in strength. And I found it helps reinforce my form better because a big thing is when people just let the bar drop 
whether they're doing reps, like high rep or low rep, as soon as it hits the ground, I would say a good 60 to 70% of lifters just let their form go to shit and they have to fully set up again by controlling it. Even if you're um, doing a full re a full reset at the bomb or a dead stop, once it touches down, you're in your form ready to pull again and you can just pop back up. Or if you're just doing a touch and go, it allows you to stay in form and keep the attention on the muscles and not so much your, your structure. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And this is one of those things that obviously can kind of be debated till the end of time, right? Like you've got people in both camps where it's like touch and go is great. Other people say touch and go is terrible. And then there's kind of these little sub discussions on, well, what constitutes touch and go? Are you bouncing? You know, what if you're just barely touching it? What if you're letting it, you know, kind of come to a, a complete stop resting the bar, but keeping the tension in it. Um, and I don't really know that there is a right answer, but I think that depending on what you're already doing right now, exploring some different potentials can, can be really valuable. And that's was kind of my experience. It sounds like that was your experience as well. So yeah. how has your training changed from when you first started lifting to, to now? Uh, the biggest thing in my training that's changed, I think, aside from just mainly managing my fatigue um, from deadlifts, because when I first started off, it was just push, 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 and not worry about the consequences. Now I find I'm having better lifts and better sessions by knowing when to call it a day or not pushing too much in the deadlift, because this is a marathon, not a sprint, so you can't really rush the success. If you do, you're just going to end up with injuries. And um, I also put more emphasis on my like auxiliary movements. So my good mornings, my stiff legs, stuff like that. I'm finding I'm putting more volume into those instead of as much volume into the main lift. Mm -hmm. So I'm using those to build up the movement so that I move more efficiently at it instead of just doing the same movement over and over and over. I know in some people will be on the fence about that saying you need to train the main movement more, but the way I feel is with deadlifts being so taxing, I would rather get in some quality sets, three to four sets, even five, and then find the volume somewhere else that's going to help translate to a bigger pull. Mm -hmm. And so what made you start exploring like some of these deadlift derivatives or even exercises um, that, that are just kind of like accessories? So when I first got into powerlifting, I had someone helping me and he'd competed for about, I think, 10 years. And he was like my coach and helping me figure things out. But like I said earlier, I was a personal trainer, so I knew how to program. I just never had programmed for powerlifting. And after working with him for the first like four to six months, even a little earlier, I started doing all the programming and writing everything up. So I kind of got the hang of it myself. And then I was always on YouTube, things like that. And, um, checking on exercises like what what will build up the upper back what's better for more light engagement in the deadlift and some of it was trial and error like i would run it in a block for myself for about four weeks and if i feel like i'm responding pretty well to it keep it in if not take it out a lot of it was trial and error in the beginning and i'm self coach now so i've found some pretty good results because i know what's been working for my body and how I need to adjust things accordingly to see a difference in certain parts of my lift. Yeah, that makes sense. And so I, I know that we've talked a lot about West side and stuff like that in, in the past. Um, I'm kind of like a, a bit of a West side apologist because <laughs> I tend to like a lot of the stuff that Louis says, like I don't train West side and I don't, I don't necessarily think that like his system is, is like the system and I don't necessarily agree with all the stuff that he says, but the dude is smart as fuck. And I think Dave Tate said it best where he's like, you know what, regardless of whether or not you agree with him, like if you, the top coach, you know, were to switch athletes with him and then you were to say, okay, you need to bet a hundred thousand dollars on who's going to produce a better athlete at the end of a fixed period of time, he's going to pick Louie and and I kind of have the, have the same belief, right? Where like, I think he's pretty bad at communicating sometimes. 
I think his stuff gets misinterpreted. I think that sometimes he says some really crazy shit. Like, (laughs) but at the end of the day, I think that if he's coaching you, like he really does know his stuff. And there's so much that I've learned that's influenced uh, um, my own training. And I was just wondering what kind of an impact he had on, on you and, and your lifting, whether it's exercise selection or even just how you program or your, your perspective on, on training. So with the conjugate method, obviously I, I had no idea what it was really. I'd seen it and just saw bands and chains and thought that's what it was and just geared lifters. But I think things kind of changed for me after I not only watched that documentary on Netflix, the West side versus the world, just seeing the methodology and how he developed everything. But also I was lucky enough to train with a guy who trained conjugate for a few years. So I got to pick his brain about it and learn certain things. And honestly, like you said, Louis has it down. He's just not the greatest communicator at times. So what he says, what he says isn't what he means all the time, but you can, I can, I take quite a bit from, what he's doing, like um, using different variations every block, just so you switch it up. I'm not doing it every week in my programming, but how he they like to switch um, the variation every week to work on a weakness. They believe in a lot of high rep sets um, for your accessory work. A lot of that has definitely influenced me. And since I've added it in, I've noticed a big difference, especially in back size and posterior chain development for sure. So when you say variation, are you talking about varying the main lift or are you talking about varying like some of your assistance work? Um, both really. Um, my, my main lift. Just, just have, on, a, on, a, on a block by block basis, I mean. Yeah, like uh, block by blocks. <laughs> let's say I'm doing a big volume block. At, I might have front squats in as my squat variation. But then when we get into strength, I might take that out and it's going to be a pause squat. And it's just stuff I didn't really play around with before. I know that's not a lot of variance, but even training with a safety squat bar for a block and then swapping that up for a straight bar or going Buffalo bar, whatever it is, just switching up the bar I'm using for a different stimulus, just always switching something up, whether it's my foot placement, uh, my foot angle. However, I need to switch things up just to see what I can get out of it. And the same with my like auxiliary movements before it was just like, it was rack pulls, leg extensions, hamstring curls, pretty simple when I first started, but then it's like, ah, that's not really cutting it for me. I'm not seeing the type of gains I think I should. And then when I started looking into things like demo deadlifts, banded demo deadlifts, snatch grip RDLs, stiff legged deadlifts, deficit RDLs, and just, swapping those out maybe every four weeks i found for myself and for the athletes i coach pretty good results with all that Mm -hmm. yeah and, and i mean that makes sense and you brought up a really important point too right about variation i think a lot of the times when people look at exercise variation they think a little bit too extreme right like you're talking the difference between a, a squat and a pause squat or a narrow stance versus a slightly wider stance you know, and, and things like that. And that, that's not really a dramatic change. And that actually is really important for preventing overuse injuries because there is a certain level of variation that's actually pretty important for injury prevention and from, from overuse. And that's kind of what you're getting at. And it's also providing a little bit of a novel stimulus. But I think a lot of the times when people think of variation, they're like, oh, well, I did squats this block. So next block, I'm going to do Zerkser squats with a triple pause while standing on a BOSU ball unbelted, you know, and it's just like the craziest fucking yeah, <laughs> thing it, that they, they can from they from, try and overcomplicate things. Too yeah. Much. And it just, I understand it's a little bit of paralysis by analysis. You're overthinking things. So you're going nowhere at the same time and you're giving yourself too much, especially if you're a new lifter, let's be real. 90% <laughs> of lifters haven't been competing and training hard for this for like six plus years. So they don't need to switch it up that huge. In my opinion, like you can get away with small little changes. It can be as simple as I'm doing pin squats and then, okay, I'm doing the pin squat at a higher pin or a lower pin. I'm doing my comp squat, but I'm bringing my feet in. 
and switching from a hip dominant squat to more of my quads. Like I don't find you have to swap things out that big and still see results. Obviously when you get towards the elite levels, you need more specificity, but I just, in the beginning, I just keep it simple. Yeah, totally. And and I think a lot of the times it's a kind of a deterrent from people getting better as well. Right. Like if, if you're constantly changing things and it's like, and that that's one criticism that I've heard from other people, like from, from my own programming is they're like, well, you don't really change that much. And it's like, yeah, but every block, all my lifters get a lot stronger, you know? And, and I, I really think that it's because the changes you need to make, first of all, the changes in volume and intensity do a lot on its own, but then the changes in exercise selection don't need to be very big. Yeah. And I mean, like the difference between a safety squat bar, front bar, front squat, high bar squat, back squat, like a, a regular low bar squat is like, there's not tons of a difference in terms of how it's going to impact your, your competition lift. But at the same time, it's, it's still enough of a change to, to really allow certain tissue structures to, to recover. Like, and I'm talking more connective tissue and things like that, that it, it's not like you're going to feel your tendons. Like you're never going to be like, Oh, my tendons feel really jacked up. Yeah. It's like, you don't feel them. And then boom, you blow a quad or something like that. So it allows for enough variation for that type of recovery to occur, but then also kind of builds a little bit of skill and builds up some of the weak points as well. Cause like um, I was one of those guys, like I came from Olympic weightlifting background where I could front squat substantially more than I could back squat, which sounds ridiculous, but I could front squat like over 400 for a double when I was a weightlifter at like 90, 90 kilos or 89 kilos or something like that body weight. But I couldn't even back squat 400 pounds right? Like not even for a single, I couldn't even back squat, I think 375 at that time. And, and it wasn't until I started doing all these other things where I was like, oh yeah, I need to actually, you know, strengthen my hips because I've got no hip stability, which is one of the main reasons why at the bottom of the squat, like I was just so terrible and I would lose it. And so a lot of the times those changes can be so effective, but they don't have to be very big. Um, so actually, I guess that kind of leads into something else. Like which exercises do you find like reliably increase your deadlift. I know you mentioned a couple of them, like dimmel deadlifts and some of the other ones, but do you find that certain exercises are better for like higher intensity, certain exercises are better for more volume? Um, what are your thoughts? So um, the higher volume, lower volume and the intensity, I I find it's all person dependent and it's more on leverages depending on it. So let, the reason I say that is if I want to work with someone who has a really long torso and I'm going to give them a good morning, I'm not going to give them high rep. I'm going to give them um, the lower rep, higher intensity kind of stuff, because for them, that's going to be what they struggle with. They're, they're already going to have a problem having that longer lever, uh, keeping everything in a neutral state when they're pulling. So I want to get them to put more emphasis on the intensity and lower reps and focus on that. Whereas if it's someone with a shorter torso, I'm going to get the reps higher and higher and higher so that they're able to do it in a, in a competition, but I'm not going to have so much variance in it that if you see two people, you're going to be like, well, he's doing 20, she's doing twos. It's just a couple reps here or there. Or, um, nothing crazy, but I've, I find the um, exercises that apply to, Every lifter I've worked with, and for myself especially, uh, a couple I 100% think people need to be doing. One is the good morning. I don't care if it's for your squat or your deadlift. You need to be doing good mornings because if it's for your squat and things get squirrely out of the hole or whatever, bar moves on you, you need to be able to recover. By doing those good mornings, you'll be able to push through that. And with the deadlift, I just help it – help it or sorry i found it it's helped me with starting position a lot and breaking the ground and not rounding it all in the upper back when i'm trying to pull so all my force is put through the ground and into the bar i think good mornings are a big one like people need to be doing them and then rdls are a big thing for me because a lot of people have weak hips and glutes just weak posterior chains in general they get into lifting and want to work quads and epic quads, but they forget about everything in the back. 
And if your hips and glutes and hamstrings aren't strong, one, your deadlift's not going to move. Two, you're not going to lock it out. So where are we really going with this? If, you, if you're weak there and just relying on quads, there's only so much you can bounce out of the hole. You're going to need some glute strength eventually. And I find that there's also, depending on how you pull, whether it's conventional or sumo, I will tweak things accordingly. So I'll have people, let's say, do a good morning with their deadlift stance. So if you're conventional, it's going to be narrow. But if you're sumo, have you do it from a wider stance. Same thing with stiff-legged and RDL, just so it's something that translates to your specific lift. And I find for certain lifts, RDLs can be done high rep or they can be done low rep. It's just I, if I'm going to go real high rep with an RDL, that's when I would be do something more like a demo, even shorter range of motion, but less weight and more explosive. And it stick to a RDL if I'm going to try and go heavy. And so what kind of training frequency are you looking at for your deadlift? And, and I'm talking both for the main lift and then also for some of the close derivatives like the RDLs and things like that that you're adding in. So I only pull a comp style deadlift once a week. And then I, on my squat day, I do deadlift accessories. I may do one or two accessories, whether that's good mornings or I've been playing around with stiff leg deficit deadlifts recently. So that'll be like my second deadlift day, really. And it's after I've already done my squats, but I don't think people need to be doing more than that really because the deadlift, even though for most people it's going to make up most of their total, it's, you don't need to train it as often to see results with it because I've seen results with lifters who only pull once every two weeks. I've seen results in my lifters who go every week. And I just find that it's too taxing of a lift to just constantly be hammering. Yes, you can get a big deadlift out of it, but it's not worth it in the end run if you're super taxed at the end of it and it's affecting your squats or bench because um, really squats, that's an accessory I didn't really touch on. My squat has been the biggest um, thing for improving my deadlift. The better my squat gets, the more my deadlift goes up, bar none. If I'm struggling with my squat, it doesn't matter what I'm good doing for good mornings or stiff legs, the deadlift's not moving the same. But I just find twice a week maximum for this uh, deadlift, once, once, maybe twice a week for squat and bench two to three times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things that I, I think anecdotally most people tend to, to see when it comes to deadlift frequency is that one to 1 1.5 times frequency. And a lot yeah. of the times you can get away with a really low frequency. Like I was deadlifting once every two weeks for a while, and I actually might go back to that uh, just because I think with the squat, you need a higher frequency in terms of the skill aspect. Like you need that to be refined. But with deadlift, there's much less of a skill component. Not, not to say that it's less difficult, but I don't know why it, it just, and this is, you know, my opinion and I, you know, maybe I'd like to hear yours as well. Okay. I just find that people don't tend to forget the skill of deadlifting, regardless of whether it's, it's sumo or conventional. Like it, it tends to be retained pretty well, even with like two weeks or even sometimes a three week, once every two or three week frequency, you know? Yeah, I, I've, I, it's funny because I was just talking to a guy in the gym about this. He was talking about how he hasn't deadlifted in a while and, oh, his deadlift's bad. I said, man, it's going to come back quicker than you think. You don't really need to train it that often. Don't worry about it. Just work on everything else. Because, yeah, I honestly, with the, with the deadlift, I've, I find it's not a very skillful technique. No matter what people are trying to tell you, like, oh, sumo is very technical. It's like, well, it takes some mobility and it might be a little bit harder to get into than conventional, but it's not that skillful of a yeah, move. It's a bit hard. <laughs> and, and, and conventional is literally what we do every single day. Like when you lean over to grab um, groceries, you get into pretty much a trap bar deadlift. You're not obviously double overhand like a conventional, but 
we hinge all the time. It's an easier pattern to put into someone. If you put a bar on their back, something you're never going to do in daily life, I find it takes way more repetition and way more practice because it doesn't matter how long. Clearly you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth and never had to walk from the wells with the waters above <laughs> or the, the buckets of water over your shoulders. Yeah. But still it's, it's like, even that, how do how do you lean over to start all that? It's a deadlift. <laughs> and, then, and then you're just going to yoke carry. But um, back to what we we're talking about, like I found, the deadlift people can find their form relatively quickly as long as they're not really emphasizing weight in the beginning. That's why I do preach the touch and go reps for deadlifts, especially for beginners, because um, for you to lower a weight, your body has to do it as efficiently as possible. So you're going to maintain form for the most part and keeping that tension. And the whole point is just when the weights touch down, then you reverse the weight back up. That way you're going through the same movement every time, every time. And when I see people doing a full reset, if your technique isn't down, it's going to change every time. So the development may take a little longer, but yeah, I agree with what you said. It's not as much of a skill, the deadlift. Like I'm sorry to any deadlifter out there who's going to be like, no, that's bullshit. It takes a lot of skill, bro. It doesn't, you can stop doing it for weeks and be fine with it to the extent that I have, a few lifters that I don't ever have them pull from the ground and then they tested their max and PR it's, I realize it's anecdotal, but I have know of other lifters who don't pull from the ground too. It's just, if you can practice half of it and still be perfect at it, when you do it come comp time, I don't think the same applies to squatting. You can't squat high for six weeks, go to a meet and then just expect to everything translate when you come out of the hole. But actually, so I kind of wanted you to, to elaborate on that a little bit because a lot of people are going to hear touch and go and everyone, I think, will kind of have a little bit of a different interpretation of what that means. Like for some people, touch and go is bouncing it off the ground. For some people, touch and go is like, you know, the bar comes down to a full stop. You release the tension, but you keep your position and then you come back up. Other people, it's like you were saying, just kind of touching it and then coming back up like what do you recommend and, and why do you recommend that over maybe potentially some other, other approaches of touch and go? Yeah. So with the way I do, when I say touch and go, what I'm referring to, I'll deadlift a weight, lock it out as I'm lowering it down as I'm kind of reversing the weight before it touches down, just so I'm not crashing the weights into the ground. Cause yes, it is easier once you get the hang of it, but um, I'm just trying to tap the weight down and then go back up and finish my reps. The reason I do this, I find you keep more time under tension. So most people who lift out there know the benefits of time under tension. You're going to get more strength and hypertrophy from it. But I find you can work with low, um, intensities and weights that you normally wouldn't be able to do for the same amount of reps. So if I'm moving 500 for six or I can touch and go it for 10, I'm going to get a couple benefits out of it. One, my body just did four more reps than it's ever done with this weight. Two, I'm going to um, reinforce my technique because I'm staying tight throughout the entire movement. And then I'm also going to boost my confidence a little bit. You're going to be like, wow, I'm really seeing weights move up. You're going to handle bigger and bigger weights. You're less intimidated by the bigger stuff. There may not be as um, great of a correlation between touch and go reps and your one rep max as there is with a dead stop, but I just find most people need to use them. And lastly, there's less to recover from. So I find they're much easier to recover from. Um, if you've done a heavy set of three touch and go opposed to three with a complete stop. I find I've, especially in myself, I don't recover the same. So I, I do use both in training, but I limit how many dead stops I do. And for me, when I talk dead stops, I've seen people talk to talk about them as Ed Cohen style deadlifts and where you lower it, staying in your form and everything's tight. You're still um, fully putting um, power into the bar. But as soon as you get down to the ground, you wait for it to settle, then you pop it up again. So you're never not in position and you never um, have a loss of tension throughout the body. 
And then I know other people think of dead stop as just like weight comes down, you fully reset, then go again. But just for me, dead stop just means let the weight settle. So you're going to wait about a second in the hole. And the reason I would use um, those opposed to touch and go, I'll maybe use them for a top set and then do a bunch of touch and go reps after because they, they are harder on you, but I find I get more out of them. I'm just not able to do them for as many sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I definitely, for, for myself, I prefer the, uh, what you were talking about from, from Ed Cohen's recommendation where you let the weight settle and then you come back up. I find those are really helpful for me. And, and I think an important thing to note as well is like, where does the athlete struggle, right? Like if someone always fucks up at the bottom, they're probably not going to be doing all the touch and goes, right? They're probably no. going to be having more opportunities to reset. But like you were saying at the same time, if someone is a beginner and their technique is just all over the place, I've also found just like you that the touch and go can help reinforce that technique so that when you do go back to the resets or letting the bar rest or whatever it is that you're doing, that it's, it's a lot more congruent. They can actually get into position from without having to be loaded first, right? Because it's obviously easier to kind of be forced into position by lowering the bar and maintain good position than it is to go from a completely relaxed state, grabbing the bar, setting up and forcing yourself in there. And, and I find that beginners and sometimes even intermediates have an easier time once they've done the touch and go and then transitioning to that. So yeah, no, I completely agree with, with everything you said there. Um, what, uh, what are some of your, your competitive goals in powerlifting? So right now what I'm kind of working towards, obviously there's not really many meets around. Um, my last meet, I had a 798 kilo total. I was chasing 800 and just came a little short, but Next time I compete, I know I'm a failure, uh, <laughs> I, uh, but I want to, at my next meet, I compete for the hundred percent raw federation here in Canada. So I want to break their world record in that federation, which is 852 kilo. And I know people are thinking, how are you going to put 50 kilo on it? Well, it's like, well, since that meet I've in gym, if you take my, Obviously, gym lifts don't matter, but we did a mock meet here. And if you put together my best gym lifts, I have, was already at a 825 kilo. So all that's left for me to do really is just put in more work. And that's my immediate goal. I want a world record total, and I want to grab the world record deadlift on the platform. The, the, that's an 810 pull. I've done 815 in the gym. So yet again, it's just something I got to do on the platform. I'm not really that too concerned about the deadlift for the record, but after that, after the 855, I'll be working towards that elusive 900 one day. And for me, it's just after I get a couple world records, I'm also going to look into possibly competing in other federations just to see what's out there. Awesome. So can you talk about the mindset that you have when you're approaching a big pull? Um, for me, deadlift is always kind of a fucking annoying lift because yeah. I've always struggled to just get into position at the bottom, right? Like um, be, because of mobility issues that have recently been fixed, actually shout out to, to my homie uh, JC back in Toronto. He showed me some techniques to, to wedge myself into the deadlift that didn't hurt my hips. So, and since then, like my deadlift has been feeling amazing. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always struggled with that. So like the squat, everything else, because you have that eccentric phase to load into it, you can kind of feel right. Like you, you unrack the bar and you're like, Oh fuck, I got this. Or you're like, okay, this is going to be tough. I got to prepare. But with the deadlift, like you have no idea until you actually pull and yeah. that, that kind of fucks with you a little bit. So, so how do you approach that psychologically? So, Depending whether I'm in a training session or a competition, it's going to be slightly different. Training, I video everything as much as I can warming up. I'll video, especially if I'm not feeling good that day, just because I find I'll, a lot of the time I'll move the bar a lot better than I think I am, and that just reinforces my mind, okay, just suck it the fuck up and you're going to be fine. Where So it's kind of easy for me to just put my head down and get the work in and stuff like that. 
I don't really think about too much, just brace and let's go. At a competition, it's a little different. Obviously, you don't know how the weights are moving. And when I'm going through my setup, as you've seen, or anyone who's seen me do a almost max effort deadlift, I take a while to set up at the top and have a pretty elaborate setup. And it's not just to be a showman or anything like that. I do it because I'm going through a sequence of things in my mind. At the top of my lift, I have my arm standing with my arms straight out. Reason I do this, when I'm taking my breaths in, I'm thinking of my stomach and taking my air in as if uh, you're pumping up a balloon. So every breath is a like a pump in and you're filling yourself up with as much air as possible. So I'm taking huge breaths, trying not to exhale much at all, and I'm filling everything up till I feel like I'm gonna explode. Once I get that, since my arms are out, then I drop my shoulders down and lock my lats in. Take one more huge breath. Once I feel like, okay, it's go time. Now everything's locked in, I just touch the bar. As soon as I touch the bar, I have a feeling that I want to exhale, but instead of exhaling, I'm pressing through the ground now and I don't um, exhale until I'm past my knees. So you do exhale at some point on the way up though. Yeah. I, I wait till it's <clears throat> past my knees because I've found if I have to exhale early, it's I'm not, if I do get it, I don't have much left in the tank after that, but I try and hold it past the knees because I find it also to an extent helps me with lockout. As soon as, like when I exhale, I can um, roll the shoulders back and pull my hips through a little bit easier. You know, it's funny you say that because for a long time, I was always a big believer of holding the breath in the entire rep, right? Because it's like, it just made sense to me. I was always like, you know what? Uh, you, you maintain your integrity. You don't lose any tension. To me, that makes sense. And I remember um, I had a podcast interview with uh, Dr. Pat Davidson a, a while back, and he kind of went off on a bunch of these really interesting tangents, and he started talking about uh, internal and external orient, or sorry, eccentric and concentric orientations and stuff like that, and and talked about how um, the exhale is the concentric orientation, I think, if if I remember correctly, and he's like, yeah, so essentially you you'd exhale on the way up, and I was always like. I was, I was like, no, I don't think so. But then that made me start paying attention to my breathing. And I had no idea about this, but I always exhale on the way up of, uh, of my squat. <laughs> and that's yeah. for me, that's my strongest lift. And I was always I, like, I kind of caught me off guard. I was like, really? I had no idea that I exhaled. But it's like, yeah, you hit the bottom. And then right as you come out of the hole, you kind of exhale just a little bit. And then I just kind of almost, it's like a second thruster almost, like, like in, in a jet. It's weird. Yeah, like how they have those thrusters so yeah. they get the extra boost to go into orbit. That's pretty yeah. much what your breath is doing for you. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's funny how that works because I never would have agreed to that until he made me realize that I was already doing it, which, which is kind of odd, but uh, it's funny how that works. Um, so oddly enough, you've actually managed to stay relatively injury-free. Like I know you had a bunch of injuries from football and basketball and things like that, but in powerlifting, you haven't really had any major injuries other than like, you know, some minor niggles and things like that, that uh, yeah. everyone kind of has. Like, what do you think has been the biggest contributing factor to staying injury free, especially, you know, while you're lifting such heavy weights? I think a big thing is a couple factors. One is when I got into being a personal trainer, I kind of specialized in um, injury rehab and things like that. And being more of a specialist in that area just because family reasons I had people with injuries and I wanted to be able to treat and prevent that stuff and work with that uh, population. But um, when I got into it, honestly, tweak, I've had minor tweaks, but nothing ever too serious um, lifting. Like I tweaked my QL a couple times and that's about as bad as it gets and tendonitis flare ups. But what has really helped me is I've been working with a, a clinic for a while now, Dynamic YYC here in Calgary. And the thing that's helped is everyone there is an actual lifter, like power lifters and Olympic lifters. So they know the demand we put on our body. So they've been giving me great activation drills and things like that. And the more I've looked up activation um, and kind of warm ups and looking at the higher level guys, you see a lot of them, they take 
quite a while to get under a bar or whatever, regardless what it is. And even seeing videos from Dave Tate, what they do for a warm up, seeing the Matt winning warm ups, just trial and error and adding in more stuff. And I've just found the biggest thing is, especially the more I do it, you need a proper warm up. If it takes a little longer, so be it. It's better than tweaking something because almost any time I've tweaked something in the gym, it's because I didn't warm up properly. And then at the same time, listening to your body. So I tweaked my QL again about six weeks ago and I was in having a squat session and this is my first session back. I'm moving, but I can tell I could go, go up weight, but old me would have been like, no, just go up weight. It's fine. Push through it. But listening to myself more and being like, no, we're done for today. Just go get your volume elsewhere, whether it's leg press, belt squat, whatever. But I found a lot of it is you just got to listen to your body, uh, get a shit ton of rest because I don't think enough people are doing it. They're not sleeping enough and then wondering, why am I not recovering? Well, because you're probably not eating enough or sleeping enough. And like, uh, like I saw on uh, the one podcast with J.M. Blakely, he was talking about when it comes to food and your recovery and everything, there's only really one way to know that you're fully recovered, and it's if you're gaining weight. And I know that sound, not everyone wants to hear that, but he says, if you're taking up in enough food and everything just to repair what you just did, then you're only recovered. You're not improving. Like you're not building because you're not in a surplus. So if that's the goal, you always need to be taking a little bit more because you need to repair from that workout you just had. And he also went on to say that something that a lot of people don't realize, you don't get stronger in the gym. And people are like, what? That's exactly what you do. No, you don't. You tear down the muscle, break down your body. You get stronger when you eat and sleep. So I've just been taking that to heart and focusing more on my recovery methods and resting up a lot more. And just if I, if deadlifts aren't feeling good or squats aren't feeling good, I'm like, fuck it. I'm, I'm done for today. I'm not going to push just to push. Yeah. That's honestly probably one of the most important lessons I've ever learned. Like anyone who knows me personally knows that I tend to, love just fucking having ridiculous awful workouts yeah like i love i just i oh, love yeah. fucking pushing super hard and um i've always been self-coached right since, since yeah. I started powerlifting and so i didn't have any what are those called like a governor on on a motorcycle that kind of prevents yeah, you yeah. From faster. yeah that, like, I, didn't, I didn't have an external governor being like no you fucking idiot <laughs> like you need to go home so like I got really strong. Well, I got stronger. Let's say that I don't really strong. <laughs> I, got, I got, I got stronger. Like I got a lot stronger, but uh, I, I would always get injured. And like, I had two very serious back injuries where like, there was one back injury that I had where I actually, you were there. Like yeah. I was on crutches for a whole year. I couldn't do shit. I couldn't even have sex. My, <laughs> my doctor was like, yeah, don't have sex. I was like, for a year? Like, I have a girlfriend. What are you talking about? The injury had nothing to do with that. Huh? The yeah, injury exactly. had nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it was really bad. And it wasn't until I really started appreciating recovery and, like, sleep and eating. But then I was always doing a pretty good job at that, actually, to be honest. But the big thing was, like you said, knowing when to walk away. Because I was always like, oh, no, if you walk away, you're a coward. Like, you yeah. know just grind through no days off da, 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 da. like all these stupid nonsensical things that you see coming out from Nike or whoever the fuck posts them. And I was always worried that I was like that. And I was like, man, I like, I don't think I'm pushing hard enough. And then I remember having a conversation with someone and they were like, are you serious? Like you push way too hard all the time. And it like, it was funny actually, cause uh, I remember when I started doing that and I started recovering I actually ended up dropping my volume dramatically. I dropped my intensity dramatically. I dropped my training frequency dramatically. And what happened was I started getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is pretty wild. So like the amount of difference that, that makes in, in terms of just knowing when to call it quits can be so important because realistically, like you can write a program for an athlete or yourself, you know, whatever, whatever it is you're doing. 
your ability to predict your athletes or your own state of readiness is really not a hundred percent. No matter how much science you think that, you know, no matter how experienced you think you are, like you can't predict for the outside world, you know, like someone has a breakup or their job is really stressful because they have a corporate takeover or whatever's going on. Like you can't plan for those things. So your ability to, to plan for that is really retarded, like retarded as in like to hinder or hold back, not like a mental disability, right? Like, yeah, it's really hindered. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I know what you mean. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's really, it's really hindered because no one has that kind of predictive power. And I think the more that I started appreciating that, the more that I started actually just listening to what I think that I need, you know, in the moment. And, and that's when things really started changing and I stopped getting injured. I started feeling way better. And, and so like, if there's one thing that I think people can get from what you're saying is like, do not gloss over that. Like, listen to what he said again and again and again. And then once you think you've got it, listen to it about 150 more times. And then you're probably in close proximity to it. Cause I think that's just so important what you were saying about recovery. Yeah. I just, cause like you, even though I, I was working with someone when I started, he was of the mindset, just push, push, push. Doesn't matter. Oh, I'm sore. Oh, you're supposed to be sore. So I thought it was normal. It's like, Oh, this hurts. Oh, I was always in pain when I trained. So I'm like, okay, it's normal. Just keep going, keep going. And then I tweak stuff and don't know how to recover, but I keep pushing and pushing through those things and making it worse to the point where I was like about a year in and I'm squatting. I feel like shit, like my ankles, it turned it, turned out to be just ankle mobility was causing all this hip pain I had. And it translated to me tweaking my QL. And when I thought I did it, I thought I broke my back because I racked the weight. I felt the pain shoot down my leg. My legs went numb and I just set, uh, fell to the ground. I was like, Oh, I'm done. Like I can't lift anymore. And then it was literally as simple as adding in activation drills and using my glutes. And I was like, Oh, never mind. I'm fine. <laughs> and, uh, and like eventually now, whenever I tweak it, I'm like, ah, oh, whatever. I just got to warm up a little more next time. But, um, I also, I've bounced ideas and asked questions to power lifters online. And some guys are like really open with sharing stuff. No problem. And one guy I gave a huge shout out to on that is Brandon Allen. Like, any question I've ever asked, he replied to me. Like, I'm not saying that so everyone goes out and throws questions his ways, but it's it's nice to get feedback from a guy who's an elite level lifter. So I was wondering with volume in terms of deadlifting. So anyone who knows me and how I trained, I used to always do for high volume six by ten, five by eight, stuff like that with deadlifts. And my numbers were always going up, going up, going up on those. But now that I, once I was in the 800 range, I'm finding like, man, I can't do this six by 10 shit with the same um, in frequency. And I can't get through all six sets like I used to in the same amount of time. And I asked him, like, what was his opinion? He's like, yeah, once you get to a certain level in a lift, you can't be really doing the same type of volume in, um, in that lift you got to dial it back because the total amount of weight you're moving is completely different now. And you're pushing like the upper limits of your well, genetic potential really. So hearing that from like an elite lifter that no, you sometimes got to listen to your body is like made me change um, my thought process a lot too. Cause I've always just been stubborn and pushed through a lot of things, which is what ha- caused most of my injuries before powerlifting and I was just always of the mindset like, oh, you're just just being soft. You're being a pussy. If you um, sit this out, just push through, push through. But once I throw that ego away, realize you're going to see a lot more gains from it. Yeah, no, for sure. And just to kind of highlight that point again, I think it's really difficult. And this is where the confusion or the kind of conversation usually crops up in, in people's heads, right? Something happens, they're not feeling it on that day or something's feeling a little, you know, like it's a little sensitive or like it's tweaked. And then you kind of have this conversation like, oh, should I call it a day? And then you're like, no, you know, if I was really dedicated, I'd push through it. And you kind of have this back and forth a little bit. 
And one thing that I always like to think of is, is there's two kinds of people, right? Like people like us who, who usually push pretty hard, I would say almost in every circumstance, you should probably default to, nah, just take it easy, you know, like yeah. dial it back because it, it's pretty much your go-to is pretty much always, yep, yeah, push forward, you know, and a lot of the times it's not the, the right answer. Whereas, you know, some people who don't necessarily push as hard should probably push a little harder, maybe push through because yeah, sometimes you do actually have to push through pain as much as people don't like saying that. And I might get chewed out for saying that, like you fucking do have to push through pain, especially if you want to get like really good. Um, yeah, cause there's a difference between pain and discomfort. And a lot of people disguise um, discomfort as pain. They think yeah. they're injured. They think yeah. they're injured because they're sore somewhere. It's like, well, you're sore. Shut up get back under that bar and keep going because a lot of them have never honestly experienced any kind of struggle or resistance. Every, when everything was going good, they weren't feeling that same thing, but now that things are actually tough, they're mentally not in it. Totally. And, and I, I think like Mike Isertel actually does a really great job of, of talking about muscle soreness, right? Because muscle soreness isn't a really good, sorry, I'm kind of drawing a parallel between the two. Muscle soreness is not a really good indicator of, of hypertrophy or muscle growth, right? No. But he always talks about it and he's like, okay, look, if you're never sore and you're not getting bigger, it's because you're not training hard enough. Yeah. He's like, but if you're, if you're not really that sore, but you're getting bigger, like who the fuck cares? You don't need to worry about it, right? And, and if you're always super, super sore, but you're never getting bigger, you're training too much. You need to dial it back, right? Yeah. So he kind of has like these little guidelines. And I think the same is, is true for, for strength and in this regard as well, right? Where it's like, okay, if you're not really getting any stronger, you're, you should probably lean a l or slant a little bit more towards the side of like, I need to just push harder and push through this. Whereas if you're getting stronger, but you're always getting injured, you know, things like that, then you should probably slant the other direction where it's like, you know what, maybe I just do need to, you know, call it in and, and not finish my next two sets. Or maybe I just need to, you know, I thought I was going to hit this weight. Maybe I should decrease it by, you know, 2.5% or 5% or whatever it might be. And, and I, I always thought that that was a really great way of looking at it because like the muscle soreness thing is just super easy. Like anyone can do that. You don't need a, a science degree or anything like that to really know where you fall in that spectrum. And I think if you take that same kind of general guideline and apply it to uh, strength, I think it applies really, really well. And so that's always kind of what I like to think about when I have those conversations. I'm always like, nope, you're way too far on this extreme. You need to just, you know, like kind of call it a day and, and pack it up and know when to stop. And, and ever since then, yeah, like I haven't been injured and in, I don't even know how long right? Which has been really, really nice. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. been, it's, it's been like about a year and a half actually. So, so it's been really good. Yeah. It's like you, you can't get any better if you're injured and that's what people need to realize is um, injuries. Well, tweaks, I should say are going to happen to everybody. If you play any sport long enough, I don't care who you are, what you do, what level, the higher level you get, the more likely you are to run into some sort of little minor tweak or injury. I'm yeah, not saying it's, it's, it's unavoidable, surgery, but it's unavoidable. It doesn't, it's more so about you and um, what you're going to do about that. If you're going to let it define you, then powerlifting is probably not for you. Just straight up. If you have a weak mind, your body's never going to be that strong because genetics are only going to take you so far and you're gonna to have to grind and i know some people don't like that approach it's like oh that's negative i'm like no i'm just being a realist with you if you can't accept that one day you're gonna wake up you're gonna go get under a bar it feels 200 pounds heavier than it should and you're a little sore like oh my lats are sore it's hard to brace or my quads or glutes or my hip is kind of bugging me today like if you can't get through those workouts when there's really nothing wrong with you. Like you need to reconsider your goals in the sport. You can do it for fun, but don't, don't whine about the progress you're not seeing by the work you're not doing. Yeah, no. And, and you mentioned something there actually that has come up a lot and I'm sure it's probably come up for you as well, where a lifter will be like, Oh man, this feels heavy. But it all like, feels heavy. 
Exactly. It's like, dude, you're strong. And, and the stronger you get, the heavier it's going to feel. Right? Yeah. Like if, if you're squatting 700 pounds, right? 80% of 700 pounds is still a lot of fucking weight. Like any way you cut it, it's a lot of weight. So of course it's going to yeah. be heavy. But it, it's not so important about like, how does it feel? Like that, that's, that's one metric. And, and usually when I say like, oh, how did it feel? I'm not saying like, did it feel heavy or did it not feel heavy? Because it's always going to feel heavy. It's like, did it move well? Yeah. You know? And if it moved heavy, pretty good, well, yeah. then, then it's like, okay, well, then we're fine, right? But when someone comes to me and they're like, oh, this felt heavy, I'm like, are you surprised? Like, your sport is literally lifting weights. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what yeah, do like, I feel like. I, I don't think, I don't know if you were at the gym then when I was going for a max squat the one no, day. No, no, I wasn't there. And, and I, the, fir- um, the first time I was. Yeah, the very, very first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First yeah I time I, the first time I ever had a 600 squat. Like, I, um, that day, I had made up in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to squat 600 today. And I remember the. At five, I did 500 and smoked it. And I was like, ah, that's, it's easy. I'm like, throw 25s on. I went 545. I almost failed and like almost failed so the weight. Bad. Yeah, yeah, I, I, almost, <laughs> I almost failed and almost failed the weight. And then I was like, no, fuck that. Put more weight on. I'm, gonna, I'm doing 600 today. And then that went up no problem. And then 600 was the ultimate grinder, but I hit it. And then it's like, just go to show – a lot of time, a lot of people in that situation would probably think, "Oh fuck, that that didn't move. I'm done for today." And I was like, "No, I know I can do more. I have faith that I can do more." And a lot of the times, a lot of the lift is in between the ears because if you don't, if you don't believe you're going to do it, no one's ever made a lift thinking I can't do this the whole time. Mm-hmm. I don't know anyone who said I cannot do this lift before um while doing it and can do it like if you load 840 on the bar and i come up to it and i'm like fuck i can't hit this and you're like do it I'm like i've already made up my mind i can't do this shit yeah it doesn't matter um what you say or if vice versa if you're supposed to squat 610 for doubles but 600 was an absolute grind for one you're like, I can't do it. I'm like, well, no, you can't because you've already gave up on yourself. Yeah. And I, I want to point something out as well to kind of piggyback on what you're saying. There's a big difference between saying I can't do something and, and like having reservations or like being uncertain. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think that everyone's uncertain, you know, like it's the sport. I, I don't, I don't think that that matters, but if you go up there and you're like, Oh, I can't do this. Like there's, there's, kind of this definitive point on the end of that, right? Where it's like, I can't do it, done, end of story. Versus, man, I don't know if I can do this, right? Like, we'll see, I guess. We'll see what happens, right? Like that, yeah. I think that's normal, but being like, oh, I can't do this. That, like, I've seen, I've seen plenty of lifters adopt that attitude and lose. And you see it a lot more in fighting. Like, I remember when I used to, when I used to box and, and compete in Muay Thai, there was a guy who he was at our camp and he was phenomenal. Like, first of all, one of the hardest hitters I've ever come across. He hit so fucking hard that when I held pads for him, I'd be like, okay, I need a break. Cause like your kicks are literally way too hard. Like they fucking hurt. And like, he hit so damn hard. He was so fast. He was so technical, just amazing. Never won any of his fights, any of them. And he was like light years above everyone that he fought because he just didn't have it mentally. And he would always like, he would find a way to lose. And, and I truly believe that that is a real thing. Like I've seen so many people defeat themselves before they end up on the platform. And, uh, oh man, Greg Panora actually said something recently. He had such a great post and it was something like most, most lifts are determined before you even yeah. walk on the platform or something like that. Yeah, that, those 40 feet or whatever. Up yeah, to the yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's so true because realistically, like if you're a good power lifter, and I don't mean like good as in, oh, you can lift a shit ton of weight, but it's like, if you generally speaking know what you're doing and your coach generally speaking knows what they're doing, they shouldn't be selecting weights that are really out of your out of your abilities. You know what I mean? It might yeah. be like, oh, you know, this is going to be a grind, but I don't know if they can get it. But it's like, if you hit the hole and you're just like done, like 
what the fuck? Like, how does that happen? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, or really? you, go to, you go to pull the bar and it literally doesn't move. Yeah. It's like, it's like, come on, man. Like that's just, in. I'm, I'm not going to say in all cases, but in a lot of cases, it's like, you just gave up. Like you just, you just resigned before you even stepped onto the platform. You knew that you weren't going to do it. And you were just like, well, I'm just going to put on a show for everyone. So they don't think I'm a quitter, you know? Yeah. And, and, and those are two completely different mindsets in, in my mind. Yeah. If, so, if you, yeah. Like there's, we don't know if we can do things. So I think there's a lot of that, like here, squat this for a triple. I sure, I guess I'll try. I, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know. Yeah, if I'll be like, able Let's see to. what happens. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of what the, that's what I take out of squats. I've, I've failed in comp twice with a squat and both times I thought a hundred percent going into the hole. I kind of knew I was like, this is going to be rough and I didn't hit it. But then I, now I looking forward, I've hit way bigger lifts and it's because in my mind, I'm like, no, what, regardless what happens, you keep fucking moving. You push through this. Mm -hmm. It's only one attempt to just keep going. And yeah. I just think obviously listen to your body, but at the same time, you got to know when to turn it on. And when it's time to perform, you got to shut out all the outside shit off and be like, no, it's time to get, get it done. Yeah. And that's where, where kind of risk assessment comes into play as well. Right? Like a lot of the times people's sort of meter for gauging risk is, is really fucked up. Right? Like they'll be like, they'll grind out a gym PR when it doesn't mean anything because it's not on the platform. But then on the platform, they're like, I don't know, like my hamstring doesn't feel right. I think I'm just going to call it. And it's like, dude, what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, that's the time to take risks in I my think, opinion. You know, I think a lot of people want the ability to have a backup or an excuse in the sport. Yeah. So it would be better to not fail it in front of people than say I hit it in the gym and I wasn't feeling it today. Mm hmm. I can go to on the platform, do 275 kilo, and then be like, I would have done 290, but I was playing conservative. It's like, why the fuck go for it? You might as well have gone to me. Are you playing conservative? Yeah, yeah. You're trying to you're trying to get your total up. So I understand in terms of making sure you have perfect numbers if you're chasing like a world record total or something like that. But I don't understand the game plan of playing it super safe so that you go nine for nine but don't pr anything you're like okay so you pretty much paid to work out yeah yeah no i yeah, agree you, you, i, I you think paid seven for, for nine a gym session total. what you did yeah you you paid to like i'm pretty much against nine for nine i've only made it once and i went 10 for 10 but that was i think i had one two three six prs in that meet so the squat, I, the way I um, approach a meet is a lot different than a lot of people will approach one. My opener is pretty much a, most people's second. My second is a PR most of the time, like whether it's 2.5 kilos, whatever it is. And then the third one is just, hey, let's see what happens. And, um, yeah. and then deadlift is a, a lot of the same way. Deadlift is like, or a bench, sorry, is, Bench, easy one. Second one, something to make sure my total is decent. Third one, let's see what a PR is. Let's do something you've never done in a meet before. And then deadlift, like my last meet, I went into the meet knowing I was only going to pull two attempts because I was like, I, d I don't know how I'm going to do with this 800 pull because I was very nervous. So I made it my second attempt. And I was like, no, I'm putting everything I have. I My main goal, I want to hit this 800 pull. So I went into everything knowing, like, I'm only doing two attempts. So my first attempt was 782, which was a PR at the time. So I opened up with a PR. And if you're not mentally strong enough, how many people are going to open up with their PR and be like, here's a five kilo PR. Now I want you to open it with it. <laughs> like. Yeah. And with no way of judging if you're going to hit it or not. Like if you miss this, your competition's over, but I want you to open it with it. So I opened with a PR and then did my 800 and then I tried 805 and couldn't lock it out. But I went in with a plan and see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
So just kind of coming back, we, we went on a, a little bit of a tangent in terms of like mindset and just some of the yeah. kind of peripheral uh, things that really impact training and, and the outcomes. But coming back to what we were talking about initially, what are some of the things that you think, or sorry, some of the strategies you think a lot of people would really benefit from implementing into their own training? A lot of visualization, uh, picturing yourself hitting the lift. Um, that's why I encourage people to always video their stuff and watch back for a little bit of positive reinforcement. You get that positive feedback. When you see lifts and everything are going good, it instills the confidence that even if the video is not there, whether you're on a competition, whatever, you know, it's, you, you have the capability of doing that and just being able to let go of a bad lift, a bad rep, whatever it is getting out of your head. A lot of people dwell on things too much. Oh, I had a bad deadlift session. Okay. That was a week ago. So how is that affecting you now? You just, just let that shit go. And um, eventually things will get better because sometimes you just go in waves like progress. Like we've talked about before progress isn't linear. So you're not just going to always feel great and always be good in the gym. You just have to have a short term memory in terms of, um, like shortcomings and move on to your next thing. So I think a lot of visualization, picturing that you are going to hit something, a lot of just, I talk to myself, not out loud, but um, in my head, like you're going to hit this lift, it's going to go up, blah, blah, blah. And you're going through the checklist of um, what do you need to do in this lift for it to go good? And you're going through everything. So your mind's been through that situation before your body ever has. Yeah, I definitely think visualization is pretty important. Like, as as a as a skill, and I find that the more that you do it, the less time you really need to get into it. You know what I mean? You can just kind of like yes. turns into like a switch. Yeah. You know, where you just kind of like as you're walking up the platform, you kind of like flip the switch, and the whole process just kind of happens on its own. Um, yeah, no, I think that's great advice. So we're coming up on that hour mark. So I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I think you gave a lot of really great advice, a lot of really useful stuff, and even gave me some things to, to kind of think about and go back and, and hit the drawing board again on. Um, so where can people find you? Where are you most active? So I'm on Instagram mostly. So you can find me on my private page or not private public page at D petties. So D P E T T I E S, or you can find me on my other page for team up. To my coach, it's just G S C Y Y C, and you can contact me on that too. Um, also, if anyone wants to catch me, catch me on my podcast, Two Guys One Bench. Check it out on YouTube or Instagram. But yeah, those are pretty much ways you can get a hold of me or see me. It's not on. Uh, you haven't put it on like Spotify or anything. Uh, no, not yet. We're looking into that. We're probably gonna move towards that soon. Okay, because I like I looked at it and uh, I was looking for it and I was like, where the fuck is this thing hosted? Yeah, it is. <laughs> right now is I think um, obviously it's always posted on the Instagram Reels. It's always on YouTube and um, apparently and Facebook. I think he has it up on. I do it with my teammate Russell Peel, and he's been great in setting this all up. It's been pretty great opportunity, honestly. Um, but yeah hopefully coming to Spotify soon. Awesome, man. So all that stuff's going to be linked up in the show notes. Definitely check them out. Um, Darrell is always posting up some, some really impressive lists of, of his, himself and a lot of his athletes as well. So thanks so much, D, for joining us. I'll uh, probably see you tomorrow, actually, I guess, at training. Yeah. All right. Thanks for having me, man. Guys, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode and took a lot from it that you can apply to your own situation to see much better results. I just have one quick personal favor to ask of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave me a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you're using. When you do this, it helps me get better at producing content and increases my exposure so I can continue putting out high-quality information for you guys. Next, I want to extend a personal invitation to shoot me a DM on Instagram at Stacked Strength. I'll help you troubleshoot anything you need. This is literally an invitation to connect with me directly. So make sure you head on over and jump into my DMs. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time.